Hello and welcome to Flipping Through the Internet's number one Mad Magazine news review and interview channel. And tonight we're flipping live. That's right. Um, hold on. I fucked up my own thing. Hold on. God damn it. And tonight we are flipping live. Tomorrow it is a lunar eclipse. I don't know if you know this. In the United States of America, totality passes a wide band across our great nation. And well, tomorrow it's a lunar eclipse. Tonight it is a humor eclipse, as my guests eclipse me in all forms of creative, <laughs> creative expression. <laughs> but before we get into that, if you're watching live, if you're watching tomorrow, um, with an ice pack on your eyes because you accidentally gazed up at the sun, please make sure you hit like, hit subscribe, and leave a comment in the chat. That's the number one way to support this channel. And it can't grow without your support. If you want to support me in another way, patreon.com slash flipping through. Link is down in the description. If you think this is worth more than a like or a comment, you can go to patreon.com and I got stuff for you. Look at, I got a, everybody gets a six set of stickers. I got a new thing that I'm working on, um, which is this, this beautiful linoleum cut print that I I've been working so hard on. I've learned how to do linoleum block printing just for this. Um, they'll be limited to uh, a certain amount. I don't know. It depends on how many ones that I can make that are, half decent. And the 3D printer is back up and running. So if you want to go deface um, public property or private property, but I prefer public property to be defaced, um, this is going to be going out to new Patreon subscribers as well. And to the two people that I still owe these to. Um, anyway, with that, these are the people that I get to thank for their support. Now, Jacqueline Gosling, Reflection of Perfection, Frank Snyder, Ed, Misamo, Tom Richmond, David Strickler, Megan McInerney, Shane Buckley, Bobby Weigel, Cam Hayden, Rob Wilson, and Rod Mead Sperry, Andrew Goldfarb, Casey Ori, and Little Cozy Nostril. Thank you guys so much for the support, and I hope I can keep on earning it. With that, enough of that. Without further ado, please welcome now this evening's guests, Tom Richmond and Desmond Devlin. Tom, Des, how are you guys doing? Doing good, doing well. Yeah, doing great. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, you were on a number of years ago, um, which I, I'll tell you, in preparation for this interview, um, and longtime viewers of this show know that I put little preparation or effort into my videos. <laughs> no one notices. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, yes, they do. <laughs> In preparation, I tried to rewatch that interview, and there was some audio pro problem with it. And I think I have to like remove it. It sounds awful. I got like five <laughs> seconds in, and I was like, "This is this is horrible." So, um, but you're back, and you're here to promote your new book, huh? Yeah, sure. absolutely. Lap trap. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so, the last uh, time you interviewed us, uh, we were we were dewy cheeked wide-eyed uh, optimists <laughs> saying, oh, this book is, we're going to have this book out in about a year. It's going to be so great. I had a full head of hair back then. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, and here we are just a mere three years later. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how does that feel though? I mean, like to, to finally have the book completed and in the hands of readers, how does that feel? Well, we're very pleased. I mean, basically, our readers, a lot of them were there with us from before the book even got started, and they backed us, and we were very anxious to get it to them. These are the people who helped, you know, make the book in their own way. So we're, we're real happy about that. <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, it was great just just having, you know, finally putting the, the you know, sending that file to the printer was, was uh, in fact, that we I threw a party right after that was over <laughs> Um, 
but uh, yeah, it was a long road, you know, and, and we didn't really expect it to take as long as it did, but we, you know, kept having to stop working on it to make, you know, to make a living and do other things. So it, uh, but, but the important thing I think to both of us is that we're, we're very pleased with the results. Like I don't, I don't pick that book up and, and see a page in there and go, man, I wish I would have you know, taken a little bit more time with this, or I should have maybe, you know, it's, it's, I'm just very happy with the results. And I, I think that, um, you know, that's the important thing. Yeah. I imagine like working professionally, like probably even for mad, right. There's seems like there's probably things that you, you have to sacrifice um, when you have a deadline, right. <laughs> You're like, but when I look at this, it's like, yeah, it, it doesn't seem like those sacrifices were made. Everything looks impeccable. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, certainly there's there were some jobs where I ended up, you know, having to push it out at the end because the deadline was tight or or I just kind of ran out of time. And it seemed like to me the the thing that makes the biggest difference for me with with the art anyway is the coloring, because ordinarily when i would do a, a mad job you know the color's the last part so i i usually spend like three days staying up all night long coloring you know all the pages and yeah. uh am i putting um, music through in this I'm, I'm, I'm having i'm hearing a music sound somewhere <laughs> yeah it's and it's not my it's not my kind of music man if you're gonna play that stuff let's get some let's yeah, pump it up you know on. get some big gigantic or uh Gal galantis or something <laughs> anyway so this time i was able to just you know really take my time with the color and if i decided i wanted to spend a whole day you know working out some crazy lighting or something i just would do it so it was yeah. that was that was refreshing and i think it shows a lot personally at least i can tell the difference in in the color uh from what you know might be a typical job i do for mad well I, yeah i think like a big part of it is the quality of the printing you know it's like you know it's magazine paper versus like i don't know what what the difference is but it's like a nicer paper that this is printed on but i think the biggest one ironically that you can tell with the quality of your coloring is the psycho <laughs> wait <laughs> like, a minute there's no color in psycho <laughs> but yeah like kyle and i were talking about it kyle bridget friend of the show um like that the 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 grays and the, i don't i don't have the language of an artist but like all like the coloring of that is just it's beautiful and it captures the film quality of that time so well that um, yeah that was i think the most impressive one well that's but, actually my favorite in the book oh yeah yeah well yeah i, I was gonna that was one of my questions here is like do you guys do you have favorite parodies that you have worked on for this book? I, you know, I guess if I had to pick one, I would say the psycho was the one that I, that I, I think turned out the best because um, only mainly because, because it was going to be black and white and because of the whole Hitchcock, you know, as aesthetic. Um, yeah. I, I used a lot of black ink on that. Like, a lot of, you know, a lot of times when I know my piece is going to get colored and I'm going to do a lot of the value work with the color, I don't bother to, you know, do big black areas or work on any high contrast or anything like that because, you know, it's just going to end up being color anyway. But this time, Hitchcock has got, you know, big shadows and all sorts of <laughs> things about his, the quality of his cinematography. And so it was a lot of fun trying to get that feel and still stay cartoony and, you know, mad and caricature and exaggerated. And so uh, I did have a lot of fun with that one. And, and originally had, was planning on doing everything um, with just washes. And so it would be a hundred percent traditional media. And, um, I started doing I, I it. And, <laughs> <laughs> Guys, can you, can you hear us? Okay. That wasn't me. Yeah. Can you hear us, Des? <laughs> I don't think you oh, can. Oh, something's happening with the sound again. Okay. Bummer. So we can start talking smack about Des. Well, 
most of the scripts were pretty poor. So what I had to do was, you know, <laughs> <to> massage them <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Yeah, what was it like to ghostwrite and draw it? You know, it got old. I had to rewrite a lot of it, you know, punch up the gags. There was a lot of punching up going on. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, well, the, the, you know, in all seriousness, though, that was a big difference between uh, working with Dez on this. And because, you know, we, I don't know, I how we did maybe 30 or more th between 30 and 40 TV and movie parodies over the years. And um, <laughs> I, I don't know how he's doing this. <laughs> oh my God. Um, but we never worked together. Like everything yeah. had to go through the, the mad, you know, like if I had a question about the script, like I was like, wait a minute, doesn't this scene happen earlier in the film? Why is it here or something like that? I don't call Des. I call Sam. I call Sam Viviano and I say, hey, I've got this question. And if he can't answer it, then he'll go to editorial. And if they can't answer it, they'll go to Des. Um, and they insisted on that. Like they got, they would get really mad if I called Des up directly and asked him a question about it. They wanted, they wanted to make sure that everything went through them and they, they, you know, it was their thing. So we didn't have that, obviously. So, yeah, why, so do you, we worked. why do you think that is that they would want that level of control? I mean, that's what, that's what editorial does, you know, in, in, in a, on a magazine, like they, they're in charge of the content, you know, so they don't want any surprises, <laughs> you know, yeah. they don't want us, us to, they didn't want me to sneak, you know, a couple copulating in the back of a panel after yeah. the fact, you know, so I'd have to, send them um, pencils and they knew I wasn't going to try anything like that, but, um, but they just wanted to make sure they, they had their finger on the pulse of what was going on, you know, no surprises. Yeah. Um, I didn't blame them, you know, their names on the magazine. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, after like going through the pages of Claptrap, I think that they do, they, they were right to, to worry a little bit about what you guys should sneak in on the pages. Cause well, that's like another thing I noticed about this is that there is a, a distinct difference with the level of humor that you go. I don't know if it's a high level or low level of humor, but you're at a different level at some point uh, in this book. Yeah, we, we talked about how, you know, how uh, far away from, you know, PG-13 rated we really wanted to get. Yeah. Um, and so we we didn't want to go too far. Like we def we definitely didn't want to put F bombs or anything in the book itself. You know, we could PG 13. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's funnier. I, Des and I both agreed. It's funnier to use the cartoon, you know, F bombs and things like that than to actually have them in there. I mean, they're, they're, yeah. there's just mm -hmm. something funny about, you know, Whoa. using asterisks and number signs and, and dollar signs instead of swear words. Um, so, it wasn't a big sacrifice there, but you know, I think yeah. some of the gags and some of the jokes were a little racier and certainly mm -hmm. um, some of them were a little less PC than I think the current mad would let you get away with. Um, I, I did a lot of like sort of dirty ish jokes at mad, but what, the way I did them wasn't just like sort of crashing in people's face. So they sort of gave me these thing, you know, write whatever you want and we'll let you know when you can't do it. <laughs> so, so we had to do it ourselves for the book, but um you know, just, you know, having a little sort of finesse to it, it makes it a little funnier, I think, in generally, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I mean, it, you can stay at that PG level, especially when you guys make references to certain things that like, um, uh, was it the John Landis reference? Uh, in <laughs> yeah, well, well, that, that was about, my subtle. <laughs> yeah. Like any movie where everybody leaves with their head attached. I forget what the word, was, <laughs> the phrase was. But it's like, whoa, that's, yeah. they're really going hard. <laughs> yeah. I think my favorite dirty joke in the book was in Toy Story. And I was like, I, just, I was so happy when I thought of it. So I, mean, I guess people could you know, go through and figure out which one it is. They'll probably get it right. But... <laughs> Uh, it was just a matter of like, sort of like a, trying to come up with a joke for a situation. And then 
it just popped into my head. It's like, I know, so it's really delightful when something comes, you know, through like that, like sort of like from the atmosphere. <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm gonna guess it's the one where uh, he and um, and Bo Peep are looking yeah, at. You're, the, you're, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're looking at they're 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 looking into each other's eyes underneath all this all the crystal glass, and Woody says to her, "I have to warn you, I'm a choking hazard." That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> So. <laughs> yeah, that's oh, a good one. Yeah, that is, although, yeah. although I, I think um, the John Lasseter uh, ride and the fair behind the last <laughs> page is, is a pretty good one too. Yeah, that's um, well. Okay, I I went onto his Wikipedia page because I was like, there must be something I'm missing. What was mm -hmm. he? Did he grope somebody? It was. It wasn't really clear, but yeah, you know, basically he was, yeah, you know, sort of, you know, too friendly with the lady. So, so yeah. he was a little handsy. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, that's. I mean, it's like it. I was pretty much able to put that together because, right. That, you know, it's like the little teacups were. <laughs> um, but Des, so a question that I asked. Well, we we're having some audio issues. I know. I I know what was going. On. I, I I didn't even solve it. It just stopped. So, yeah. <laughs> put it on um, the cord. Do you have a parody in Claptrap that you are especially attached to or proud of? Oh, like, um, favorite child. Well, we did, I mean, we did the best we could with all of them, obviously, but, um, I mean, one, one of the, I'm not, I'm not sure about being proud. It's just may not be a correct answer for your question, but, um, we, we knew it was like it was Tom's drawing everything and I'm writing everything, and, and most of the book is in a movie parody format. So even it's going to look similar, if not the same. So I was trying to think of how can we differentiate things? So the idea of doing, um, you know, one is a musical, which because I loved Frank Jacobs stuff back in the day. And I you know, got to speak to Frank Jacobs a bit, you know, over the last several years before he passed away. And mm -hmm. so I thought that's a good, you know, solution. Also like a throwback to the, to the people who are supporting the book. They enjoyed that kind of stuff as well. So um, we did the Citizen Kane one, and that was sort of the old style, the '50s man. So it, I, was, I was just saying, how can we break these things up? So you know, in, in addition to the additional material, but it was. Um, so I, I, when 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 we found a solution that appeared to work, and sort of maybe change the format, change the style, and it you know it's it you know it it solves the similarity problem, but it was also you know, stayed funny like the rest. We hope um, that was good. I don't know if I was like. The, full of pride with that but i was full of like pleasure that we you know came up with a solution that you know tom could you know draw and like you know come up with <laughs> yeah and yeah so you're talking about the the i guess the interstitials the things that you put in in between all of the parodies well like, those as well yeah we knew we always knew it wasn't going to just be strict parodies all the way from you know last first page to the last page we knew we had to break it up just for the sake yeah. of making a better book and keeping the reader interested well, that was like such a fun surprise to like crack open that book and to have all of those extra mm -hmm. things in there. Like, uh, could you tell us a little bit about that, like that process of coming up with those? Well, as far as the surprise goes, basically, we, we you know, we were promoting the book for you know, a number, uh, a number of a couple of years. And once we every time we picked a movie that we were going to do, we put that news out there. So we're going to parody you know, Blade Runner, we're going to parody Unforgiven, whatever it was. But all the extra stuff we kept under wraps. We said we, we told people we were doing it, that there's going, to be, there's going to be additional material. but We never revealed what it was. And that was pr pretty deliberate because you wanted all the people who were supporting us. You know, not to know everything they were going to get. I mean, they, they knew enough that they supported in the first place, whether it's because they like Tom's art or my writing or Mad in general or movie parodies, you know. But we, we, it was like a, a good, what would it be? It'd probably be like about a fifth of the book or more was like completely unknown to them. And that's the way we wanted to keep it. Um, yeah. So, but as far as like coming up with stuff, um, we knew we were going to do some um, movie parody posters because, you um, the, the backers asked, you know, wanted us to do it. We, we set that as a goal and they matched it. So then it was sort of a matter, you know, we wanted to, I, when I was doing that, I was trying to keep all the new stuff, the, the extra stuff, not the new stuff, the extra stuff as far away from the 12 movies we were doing as possible. So we did Blues Brothers. I wasn't going to do like a Blues Brothers extra. You weren't going to do Citizen Kane extra. Yeah. So it was a matter of sort of spreading the movie net as wide as possible with other things that we knew people would like. Or yeah, yeah, movies here to like whether they like what we did, who knows? But um, 
Yeah, but it was, and we thought it was necessary to keep the book, you know, varied, you know, as much as we could. Yeah, one one of the, my favorites was um, the Sound of Music one, where it was like a trauma <laughs> film. Mm -hmm. um, and just seeing that, like seeing trauma films mentioned, with I, that alone was like so much fun. Um, yeah, I uh, I really enjoyed that. Yeah, uh, a few of our movie parodies were kind of like wacky packages, you know, turned it, put it rolling up into um, movie parody posts. And that a lot of Tom was like sort of, you know, crucial to all that. I mean, making it look, you know, like the, the sound of um, mutants was, you know, two pages. So that was that's, you know, if he doesn't nail it, it doesn't work. So yeah. the fact that you liked it, it tells us how well it did. Yeah. Uh, well, I think we're it's time to get into our first game. Um, our first game is, uh, name that. <laughs> yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for name that chicken at the Mad Magazine comic game, where we look at all of the little things in life. The game is as follows. Desmond Devlin and Tom Richmond, you are our players today. Um, Desmond, you will be shown images, illustrations done by Tom Richmond, and it is your job to, as best you can, tell us where they are from. What are they parodying? Um, the the season of the the magazine that it came out in the number the issue number the cover price of that issue any okay, number sure everything sure. <laughs> yeah. who is the cover artist mm -hmm. uh, okay, page, yeah. right hand page sure. <laughs> yeah uh, Tom you will be shown a little box of text that uh, <laughs> has words written by Desmond and your job likewise is to do the best you can to tell us what it is from. So uh, do you guys have any questions about this game? Can I do the boxes that I wrote? That might be easier. It's going to be a lot of, uh, it's going to be some net bad flashbacks for me right now. <laughs> Reading Des's right. gags and coming up with the visual in my head. Yeah, enough you have to read it the first time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's get going. Des, you are going to go first in this uh -huh. round of Name That Chicken Fat. All right. So our producer will uh, click next so we can see that beautiful image. This delay is unacceptable. It's technical. Oh. All right. Oh, okay. Well, this, that's, that's for Tom. Yeah, this is for Tom. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Tom's I just spoke. First. <laughs> yeah. Did, did I ever tell you how I got these scars? I was disfigured by a dangerously defective spork. I'm suing the company right now. All right, so that was definitely from the Dork Knight uh, reruns, I believe. Uh, that was the title, The Dark Knight Returns. Mm -hmm. Yes, Tom, um, you heard the chicken. That means you are correct. That's right. That is from the Dork Knight reruns. Mm -hmm. Yes, in Mad Magazine number, which one is it? Uh, 495. So you missed the bonus point. You didn't guess. Oh, man, I'm it. never going to get that. Um, <laughs> I never remember what issue it was in. All right. And um, yeah, <coughs> you, you you did the illustration on this, right? I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is like, and I, I had to pick this one because you are quite the Batman fan. I am. Yeah, this is, yeah. I was I'm very was happy. To get to, yeah, very happy to get to do all three of the Christopher Nolan Batman films. Yeah. Um, all right. Producer is going to... Uh, Show us the first image. All right, Desmond. Oh, what? Name that chicken fat. I don't know. A, uh, Is that going to be picture. from the starchy, you know, um, the, the, the starchy parody did? I'm not sure that's, I'm correct in this. You are correct. All right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, for the bonus point, what is the issue number? One, yeah, that's, that's an issue. One. <laughs> that, I didn't know I knew that. I'm sure about the answer, but I'm sure. <laughs> <about the number. laughs> 
All right. Yes. Uh, here, click next, Mr. Producer, please. Oh, yeah. This is from Starchy. Hey, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> from the, the rebooted Mad Magazine. Um, Tom Richmond, you did this, uh, this illustration. Um, I did. Yeah. And it's beautiful. This was, um, I saw in the chat, there was like some mix up between Will Elder and Wally Wood. Who were you parodying? during that and that's like those are two yeah. guys i know they're <laughs> they're distinct right they have their own uh, style but like, I, I constantly get them confused that's that's uh wally or that's uh will elder and he did the original starchy uh parody and this was supposed to be kind of like a sequel to it and it yeah. was this was all bill morrison's idea and he in his first issue said, this is what i want to do we're going to do a parody of riverdale but I want the first several pages to be like from starchy and then they get into a time machine and they end up in the 2010s or whenever it was that Riverdale was uh, set in. And then all of a sudden they're real people. And yes, uh, yeah, and it was, it was a funny idea and this was great. I really loved, um, you know, kind of going back in time and trying to do the old school uh, elder look, but it was fun. Yeah. So, you guys, you also went back in time um, in Claptrap and um, you were parodying. What's the name of that movie? What is it called? Citizen Kane. Citizen Kane. Yeah. <laughs> I was I was watching uh, an interview you did recently and you, you had said like, we picked movies that everybody has seen. And if you haven't seen them, you've been deliberately avoidant of them. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you how many of these movies I haven't seen. Oh, a lot but... of people don't have a complete list, as we've heard from their you know, backers about that. But there, yeah, there, was, yeah. there was one guy who was writing, he was like watching the original movies he hadn't seen before reading our parodies, which is a lot of unnecessary work, but, you know, he seems yeah. to enjoy it. <laughs> so I have, I have a, a writing question and a um, and an art question about that Citizen Kane one. Mm -hmm. When you're writing for like an older style mad parody like did was did your writing style have to change did your approach have to change for that one um well yes and no I, I, before i even started writing i um i i did a lot of research into the kurtzman era comic books because we're it, for the idea is, uh, citizen kane was like older than mad you know man it was, it's like it's about a decade before mad even came out so but then the idea came we, we were looking for ways to differentiate the parodies and i had the idea of while we do something that looks like the old fifties mad because it's, you know, it's that's closer to citizen Kane than mad is even. Um, yeah. and so certainly I did, but we didn't, um, I had seen parodies of EC comic stuff before and mad stuff before. And a lot of them were sort of just sort of like, you know, throwing some references. So they draw, you know, whatever, um, parody they're doing and they call somebody Melvin. And then that was supposed to be the joke. And it's like, well, that's not enough, you know, because, you know, just listing, you know, you know, Potter Zebby or whatever is, you know, okay, that's, you know, shows you've read bad, but it doesn't show you're really getting the spirit of mad. So yeah. I went, I literally went through the old 23 comic books and I was going through the word balloons and counting the number of words per balloon to sort of get mm -hmm. the same kind of weight and same kind of um, pacing that Kurtzman used. And I also noticed that a lot of his parodies, um, his pages with these three panel sequences, which were generally physical action. So it was like something, so, you know, so it wasn't, you know, um, just three in a row, but it was like, you know, A to B to C people would move or people would attack each other. People would like, you know, jump to molest each other, whatever the joke was going to be. So I made yeah. sure to put one of those on each page of the Citizen Kane thing, because he kind of did the same thing back then. So it was really sort of like you get the mechanics and the structure of Kurtzman stuff before you even try to like, you know, do jokes that were as good as his, um, or yeah. that, that's which is not really what I was doing, but it's, you know, you want basically after you're all done with all this, you know, research stuff, you still gotta be funny. So, um, but I didn't, so I, it was kind of like just doing a lot of, you know, academic work on like, you know, how he put things together piece by piece. So we could use those pieces to do the effect we want to have. Well, and with the, uh, like Kurtzman also do a lot of stuff like breaking the fourth wall. And I sure. noticed in that one, um it would be like that there was that guy po poking his head out and going like "Ooh, a fancy shot we did right that was a running gag we did throughout the thing and that's exactly right you caught that so yeah yeah and then so tom what was like doing the artwork for that one in particular 
Um, I became really fascinated with craft tint. Um, <laughs> I noticed like you, you, you were, was that like, was that done digitally or did you actually have craft tint paper that you were like exposing? No, sadly, they stopped making craft tint in 1996. So okay. uh, I would have had some trouble finding some. Um, actually, <clears throat> uh, when I did that Quentin Tarantino um, parody, fake fake TV show parody from Mad uh, Mad Number Nine, yeah. um, I was doing trying to em emulate a 60s look to the art, and they used a lot of craft tint back in those days or <clears throat> Mort did. And if people uh, listening don't know what craft tint is, basically it was, it's a, it's a board. It was a board like illustration board or Bristol board, but it had uh, a chemical pattern in it of diagonal lines and you couldn't see it until you used a special clear chemical and one chemical would make the lines go one way and the other chemical would make the lines go the other way. And if you layered them, they'd crisscross. So you could get all these, uh, you know, patterns and, and kind of values by using these, these uh, chemical washes. Man, that, that stuff stinks so bad. When you were done using it, I, I think I only used it once in my whole life. I did an editorial cartoon uh, as a project for uh, a college, and I got a hold of a piece of craft tint for it. And I'm pretty sure that um, I lost a considerable number of brain cells uh, while I was using that. that yeah, yeah, I think it has like, <laughs> the developer has like mercury in it or and something. He's, he's like cartoonist that. who died of an odd disease, probably just crafted. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be some bad stuff. Anyway, I couldn't get a hold of any, so I did it myself. I created these, um, these two directional, and then it was just like a whole page of it. And then I would put it in and I would erase away where I wanted the, the lines <laughs> to show up okay. and, um, it, and it worked okay with the, with the, with a piece for, uh, once upon a time in Hollywood, but the lines were a little too close together and they printed kind of funky. So when we did this one, um, I tried to find a different solution and, you know, it was years later and now that I could, I was able to buy some brushes that oh. simulate this craft tint and it was awesome because not only did they simulate it but you could decide how much distress look it would have like it, it would have like little imperfections in it um so that it would give it you know like a, a hand done look like it was you know done with uh, uh imperf imperfect paper and fibers and things like that so yeah so yeah, half I the craft tint okay. part of it was that. So anytime you see the diagonal lines, that was done with those brushes. Anytime you see the dot patterns, the zipatone type patterns, those yeah. I made myself. And oh, cool. so I had like, yeah, I had some different ones. I had like a 10% dot pattern and a 30% dot pattern. And then I did a grade gradated dot pattern, um, yeah. a couple of those so that I could use both effects because the funny thing is we decided we wanted to do a Kurtzman look, you know, to that, but all of Kurtzman's cartoon comics were in color and <laughs> we didn't want to do Citizen Kane in color. So, yeah. so I had to do like the art style of the old comics, but use the sixties kind of, um, you know, craft tint, a uh, zip -a tone type effects that they did in, in the early magazine days. Um, uh, so it was sort of a combination of Frankensteining of the old mad look. It, I mean, it worked so well. Um, but the thing with like those brushes, boy, th that tricked me, man. Like the imper their technology with digital art is great now because it's, um, yeah, I thought it, I, I was really hoping it was real. Um, <laughs> anyway. Well, all the inks were real. Like, yeah. you know, uh, I, I inked it mostly with a brush because I wanted to get, that brushy look that um and i told des too at the beginning i said look i don't want to emulate any one artist from ec you know yeah. i want to try to just give it the feel of it without you know making it an obvious like the the one with starchy that was a flat out will elder uh mimic you know will elder I mean, had I, the original starchy so it had to yeah, yeah. <laughs> i tried i tried as hard as i could to make it look exactly like will elder would have done it I didn't try that hard to try to make this look like any one artist, but 
at the end of the day, it just, there was just so much Wally wood in me that I just couldn't stop it from coming out. So it looks, <laughs> yeah. it basically, it looks like a wood homage, but you know, um, I could have, I could have made it really look a lot more like wood, I guess, if I, if I would have tried harder, but I thought it, I thought it turned out, you know, in a way that gives you the feel of it without, you know, being a slavish, you know, mimic of, of uh, what they did. So. Yeah. And that, no, there was I another think... party we kept under wraps so we didn't tell people we were planning to do it that way. So that, you know, they'd be more surprised and, you know, hopefully enjoy what they saw. Yeah. Well, and that's, well, two things. One, Wally Wood is a is a Minnesota boy too. I don't know Correct. if you were aware of that, Tom. Yeah, um, I was trying to explain to to friend of the show Kyle Bridget that if you're if you're from Minnesota, you know every famous person who's ever touched foot in Minnesota. <laughs> yeah. uh, he doesn't believe me, but I, I keep proving him wrong. Um, so I I put out to the uh, my patrons uh, if they have any questions to to send them my way. Um, this comes from Shane Buckley. What was it like when you were new at MAD? What was it like with those legendary UGO eyes? And did you ever get over their your awe of them? I, that was my typo. Sorry about that. Well, I, I go a little further back in MAD than Tom. So, um, I, so some, by the time he got around, some of them weren't even around anymore, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I always think when I started at MAD, the first – there's like a – I, I think I'm not the only writer. You sort of like, who did I get? Who did I miss? You know, as far as drawing things, because there's so many great artists that you appreciate over the years. And when I first started at Mad, the first guy to draw my, one of my articles was uh, George Woodbridge, who I loved. And then right after that, it was I, I got like, um, Don Martin and Paul Coker and Al Jaffe and Jack Davis. I mean, it's like you know, there's not enough heads on Mount Rushmore. To, to carry all those guys for me. So it was, it was you know, a thrill to see, you know, I, it wasn't like they were calling me and saying, hey, Des, do you think if this article goes with this guy or this guy? They did, the editors made those decisions. So I get the issues and see who did them. But it was like just one, you know, you know, sort of legendary, you know, central mad figure for decades after another. Um, so I eventually, I, I guess I was sort of in all of them at the beginning, you know, when I was meeting them one by one at events or something. But um, if, if you just have such a, an appreciation for their like, their ability, their longevity, and most of the, most of them were really like very friendly and you know very you know um, complimentary and interested in you know just talking normal stuff about matter or just about life in general. So you you sort of get over it, but of course you know these guys are so good, you know you can appreciate them for the rest of your life. Yeah. Did you ever have to like call in and be like, listen, Nick? You tell Woodbridge if he ever draws my shit like this again, <laughs> I'm coming out there. I have an opposite story. I went in one time to the office. I dropped by and Nick saw me. He goes, "Oh, hi, Des. I mean, we just we just gave your that article you did to Rick Tolka. I think he can save it." <laughs> <laughs> so, oh my gosh, uh, Tom, how how about you? Like, what was getting scripts from different? Uh, UGOI writers. What is that like? Well, the the first uh, the first job I ever had printed in Mad was written by Dick D. Bartolo. So, <laughs> you know, that was that was a pretty big thrill. Um, yeah. Everybody at Mad was super uh, welcoming. Like there was there's very few egos there. It, it's funny when when you get to when when you when you get to the point where you're a certifiable genius, you know, uh, you don't have to be, um, uh, egotistical. It's like some of the, some of the most talented people are, are the most humble and not just fake humble. They're like real humble, like Jack Davis. Yeah. I mean, Jack Davis would, didn't really think his stuff was all, you know, all that. He says, Oh, it's just a drawing. You know, and he says, if you, if I don't like that, if you don't like that one, I'll just tear it up. I'll get draw you another one. You know, and it's just like, ah, you just tore up the drawing. Um, but no, they were all like that. And they, and they all were super glad that you were there. And they, you know, they, they wanted to know about you and your family. And, and I had met Mort and Jack and um, Nick and a whole bunch of mad guys through the National Cartoonist Society before I even started for MAD. So I'd had a chance to, to get to know them a little bit uh, ahead of time. And I just knew they were, you know, genuine people and just really great to, to be with. And, and 
uh, when I started, like I started pretty late. <clears throat> so it was 2000 when I started with mad, it was still mad at the time. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, yeah. Nick, uh, you know, Bill had been, Bill Gaines had been dead for 10 years by then, but, um, Nick Meglin and John Ficarra were still the main editors, you know, um, Charlie and Joe were the, the editor editors. And there were people there that had been there for a long time. And, and it was still very much of the mad family. And they still had just for the very first few years that I worked for them, they still had their hot, their holiday party. Oh. And, and the first holiday party was, was at the society of illustrators in New York. And my wife and I flew in to New York from Minnesota just for this holiday party. And I mean, I was in that room just like, huh? yeah, with my mouth hanging open. Oh, oh, that's Peter Paul Porges, you know, uh, or that's, uh, uh, who did I meet that first time? I met Porges. I met um, uh, Paul Coker was there, uh, Jaffe, of course. Um, uh, Frank Jacobs was there the next year. I think they gave him the mad book or maybe that was the year they gave him the mad book. I can't remember. I don't remember the years but, offhand, but he was definitely there for one year. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I got to meet some guys and, you know, people that I'd been reading <clears throat> their stuff for 25 years, you know? Yeah. So it was pretty cool. And not a single one of them were anything like, Oh, like, you know, Oh, I saw the piece that you just got, you know, did you're, welcome to the usual gang of idiots. You know, you fit right in. And I was like, wow. <laughs> okay. you know, the part of he's talking about, like Frank, there was, Frank Jacobs was in California. He was an older guy at that point. So he didn't come into New York very often. But yeah. um, they used to give out a book after the mad trips. They, you, know, you know about the mad trips where Gaines would take the staff and the uh, artists. And then a couple months later, they'd have a dinner party. And a lot of the writers and artists would draw or write things to put in a big book. They give to, you know, as a thank you to Bill Gaines. And after yeah. he got enough of these books, they said, let's give these books to somebody else. He's already got like, you know, 15 of them or something. So they, they gave him to more trucker. They gave him to, you know, Paul Coker. And so Frank Jacobs, they gave him to one year. So he flew in for that. And I was there for like, you know, an hour, an hour and a half at the party. And Frank Jacobs was sort of like you know, the guest of honor. But I just sort of stayed away. And eventually I sort of walked over and said, hello, Mr. Jacobs. I'm just there. He goes, oh, you. You know, he goes, <laughs> I saw he some article I'd written a couple years earlier. I said, this article, he mentions a joke. He said, when you, I saw that joke, I knew you were going to make it in mad. I said, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> that he's actually paying attention to something I did, let alone complimenting. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I, most, most of the old guys at mad were, um, you know, the original guys. You know, for the, I mean, they were really, you know, very friendly and, you know, um, you know, what, you know, it didn't take long to like, you know, get over the, you know, ah, you know, it's, you know, it's Jack Davis or something, you know, it's because he's such a warm and pleasant guy. I was yeah. on the last mad trip and he and his wife were there and they were so polite and they're so well mattered. And I felt like a rat standing next to us. I'm not that bad a guy, <laughs> but like these guys, they're so genteel and so, and so warm it's like oh i gotta up my game this is not not right yeah. <laughs> i gotta learn from them oh that's uh, those are great stories and i imagine like it, it would have to feel so amazing not just to meet somebody but to meet mm -hmm. somebody that you admire and have them mm -hmm. know who you are that has to be mm -hmm. a next level thing. that was out of the blue he's, he's so effusive about some article it wasn't even a, an article from the previous issue it's like from a couple of years earlier it's like you know I, somehow he liked that joke. So, yeah. so we're going to move on to our next round of our game. This is, Ooh. we're still in the middle of uh, a game show. Don't, don't forget. Um, this one is for uh, Tom Richmond. Okay. <laughs> Who the hell is Michael Jackson? You should remember him. He's your hero. He wore one white glove when he played with his monkey. Shut up, <laughs> suckwad. <laughs> Well, uh, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm guessing that's an, that's uh, the MTV parody uh, with Beavis and Butthead. I don't know the name of the issue. Well, yeah, it's Beavis and Butthead get old. Okay, <laughs> yeah, that is that, that is correct. You um, he that comes it. from number three hundred thirty-six. Very good. I mean, that first <laughs> one. I tried to give you guys a gimme on the first one. <laughs> uh, very. Uh, what is a uh, Kyle, could you bring us our next uh, slide and we'll, we'll reveal? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> Sam Viviano, old. draw that. So. Yeah. Um, all right. Des, you are up next. Okay. 
This is uh, oh. the Jenkins fan club. You Is wrote this. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to lose. I'm um, full. I, I don't remember. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> oh, all right. Where is that? Oh, yeah. Dying chicken. <laughs> yes, the dying chicken. This is from the Malcolm in the Middle uh, parody. Oh, the Mad Magazine number 403. That's the first article Tom and I did together. I should have known that. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yep. That's the first one you guys had the, the where you were assigned to work with one another? Right. Uh, oh. Yeah, that you were credited as the... Because I did a couple of those fake covers for the oh, issue 400. Okay, you know, Tom, Tom, it's, you know, it's the first full article, but... Um, yeah. I, that's, basically, that's, he, that's, he did the article with Victor <laughs> Bartolo that he mentioned earlier, but then um, for it, Mad number 400, I wrote the Untold History of Mad, which was, you know, untold because it was all lies. Um, yeah. <laughs> and part of that was we I made up, like, fake covers, like, through the 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, with, you know and Tom was one of the people who did the, those covers that you know never existed but were supposedly to look back at mad and then this was the issue after that issue 401 <laughs> yeah yeah that no, includes this... the that includes the infamous uh alfred with mickey mouse and the mouse trap cover that some <laughs> idiot posts every other day on one of the mad facebook pages and it was their and, favorite cover when they were kids yeah. <laughs> and then there's a huge fight about this is a fake cover and, it, and it's like have the, you not the month been is wrong group? or the price is wrong or something. I know it's a fake. And it's like, yeah. Yeah, we know it's a fake too. We, fake, we faked it. <laughs> you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to find that image. And tomorrow morning, I'm going to post it on my Instagram and say, this is my favorite mad cover from when I was a kid. <laughs> and if I had known people loved that cover so much, I would have just kept it out of that article and tried to sell it to them for a future issue and get the full page rate rather than just <laughs> yeah. a little piece of a page <laughs> that whatever it was worth. <laughs> Uh, and before we oh, move back to the, the previous slide, producer, please. Of course, I, I picked this piece of chicken fat because it my favorite article growing up, one of my favorites, this wasn't, I can't lie to my audience, um, was Melvin and Jenkins. That, Desmond, you were writing on that? <laughs> yes. Was, <laughs> I, and I, I watched an interview and you guys are like, you, you said, well, we could get a little bit raunchier than we could at Mad Magazine. And my immediate mm -hmm. thought was like, not raunchier than Desmond got with <laughs> Melvin and Jenkins. That's for sure. I sort of had an acceptable raunch level. I, 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 I accept that. <laughs> but um, well, I, I had done a parody of um, be, um, Goofus and Gallant. I think it was like yeah. Goofus and Gallant's Guide to you know, Dating or something like that whatever and they liked it it turned out well and they wanted to do more of them but then they said we have to create these characters it, it, sort of tc was on them to create ip and the character sort of things but on top of that you, if you do like one parody of goofus and gallant then it's a parody and bad if you do 10 of them then you're sort of like you know stepping on their copyright so it, we, we so we changed it up a bit and you came with the characters melvin and jenkins and i did those for a number of years yeah so i'm glad you like those <laughs> all right sweet uh, so, uh, producer, producer, quit making excuses, please. Uh, <laughs> that's like the least professional thing I've ever seen you post on here. Uh, so David Strickler sent in two questions, well, one for each of you. And this one is more towards um, Des. Okay. When presented with the task of doing a movie parody, what is your process? Would you be kind enough to describe how you go about things from step one? You know, mm -hmm. the blank page. Uh, to considering what scenes are appropriate, what kinds of jokes you want to include without being repetitious. Okay. Well, actually, this is good timing. Tom and I have just this past week or so wrapped up a PDF, uh, which was one of the promised perks for um, Claptrap. And we basically was sort of like a you know, look behind the scenes at uh, how to make a movie parody. The one we did for the PDF was the Star Wars parody in the book. Um, yeah. And so, like, all these questions are answered in there, but I'm not going to, like, you know, leave you high and dry and not answer. But... Um, <laughs> Basically, um, but with, uh, the people who were get, the, are all of our backers, you know, who helped get the book published in the first place, the PD, the long promised PDF is soon to be sent out in the you know the coming weeks. So you know, and, you know we're, we're fulfilling them, you know, bit by bit. <laughs> um, Basic. I mean, um, when I, I go to a movie, if I went to a movie in a movie theater, you know, back in the old days when people did that, um, I would go there with a long legal pad and a pen that sort of lit up in the dark 
And I'd sort of like watch the movie and I'd be writing down everything that happens, like all the, you know, all the characters' names if they came up or all the scenes sort of in the order they came up. And if I thought of a joke, I'd jot that down. And, and basically, you'd have, I'd have a few pages by the time the movie was over. And then you sort of got to go home and say, okay, which were the scenes that mattered? Um, which were the characters that had to be included? It, it, it's, it's sort of not, at MAD, um, it was a matter of space. Most of the parodies I did were six pages. That was sort of the general form. Sometimes they do five, sometimes they do seven or eight. But um, typically it was a six page, you know, format you were looking at. And then how, how do you fit the movie into that? What do you have to cut? So the first thing you do is you're cutting pieces and you just sort of, um, and this, it's so, it, there's so many different balls you got to juggle in doing a, a parody of a movie or a TV show. Um, when Bill, uh, Bill Morrison got the job of editor and taking over, he, he, he actually had, had he come into the Manhattan. He was in the city for a week or two, hanging out at Mad, watching them do what they do, trying to pick up whatever information you could pick up. And they brought me in so I could sit in a room with them for an hour and I have to explain movie parodies and like have what, what I did or what the things, you know. So, the, so I, was, I gave him his best of tutorials I know to do, but I'm, I'm just me. I'm not Arnie Kogan. I'm not Dick DiBartolo, Stan Hart. I mean, these guys had their own way of doing things too. So he, all he got was my perspective on it for whatever use that was to him. You'd have to ask to hit Bill if it was any use at all. Um, but I mean, basically you just sort of decide, are, are you going to do a, a splash where they're all introducing themselves in the classic fashion or can you get away with a one page Splash, it's different, and sort of introduce the characters as they go along, and the endings are always, as long as the endings are sort of abrupt, and you know, um, you're like, you know, kind of like you brought in another reference that closes that. I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things to answer for yourself, and a lot of things to fit in or cut out. And a lot of it's about the cutting, like, you know, how do you cut something and not hurt the movie you're doing or the parody you're doing? So, but Hopefully, when the PDF comes out, hopefully it's some people. I, I'm sure David will get one. You know, he's one of our backers. So, you know, hopefully they'll answer more questions. Loads of Tom stuff in the PDF, and you know, both of them explaining as best we could what we did or what we do. Oh. Uh oh. Yeah, when you get that PDF, I actually uh, do a, a go through a panel where I I, I draw every line. And then it's that's that's the first 160 pages of the of the uh, PDF. But <laughs> it's but it's the most <laughs> yeah. But it's it's the most riveting of the hundred uh, of the 350 <laughs> pages. It's the most riveting. Well, Patrick, we cannot hear you. It sounds you off, muted. Sorry. Oh, you know what? Do you know why? <laughs> Just, uh, I was burping. Oh, at least you weren't playing music. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Nor normally I belch openly, but I was like, there's guests here. I better. Um... Anyway, I was going to say you, you can get that the claptrap book that you were talking about on claptrap.com or no claptrapbook.com. Right. And um, we have a banner down below and it's also down in the description of this video. Uh, is that, do you, can you only get that PDF if you were a backer of the um Program. Yes. Yeah. Okay. They, they, you know, one, there, there was a certain level where people would buy, they'd get the book plus the PDF. So it was a, spe it was a special attraction that, you know, or anything yeah. above that too. So we, I, I have the list to go through and figure out who's, who gets it. You know, we'll see what happens. All right. So we're going to hop on to our next slide, which is <clears> this. <throat> so Tom, I'm Cock, the leader. <laughs> I have such <laughs> stage fright that the only way I can perform is in an empty room with absolutely no one watching, which leaves me with only one career option, opening for Hootie and the Blowfish. You may remember me oh. as young John Cotter. <laughs> I know this now. <laughs> John Cotter in Terminator 2. Or you may remember me as the brother in American History X. One thing's for sure. <laughs> you sure won't remember me from this waste of film. Are you going to prove Desmond Ray right? Alma drew it. I'll give you that. Ray Alma did it. Oh, I know. Yeah, this is the this is the parody of uh, Detroit Rock City. Um, no, what? Just... Yeah, and Ray Alma drew it. Yeah, yeah, you are absolutely correct. That's a... okay. You guys, I did not expect you to be able to get that one. Uh, 
That's actually the first, <laughs> that's the first movie parody I ever did for Mad. Was the really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't and, know um, that. And it, um, in in retrospect, it was sort of a tryout. They want you basically. Um, I, I I never got a full accounting of this, but basically, Stan Hart was sort of you know ending wrapping up his career, and they needed so they wanted to see if I could do parodies that I could fill in. And so they gave me this as a test, and I think they probably put Ray into it as a test for the artist as well. Um, and it turned—I I thought it turned out. I mean, well, I—I I, I had, had a gimmick in this, where basically I was watching this movie, and it was so derivative and so lame. It was—it was, it wasn't funny. It was—it was—it's really a, a bad, cheap movie. But it wasn't just a matter of not doing it well. They were stealing stuff from other movies. And I got there after I had a list of like, here's like six, seven things like clearly stuff. I said, what if I could do this in every panel? So literally every panel contains something that it either was, or at least I alleged, alleged it was stolen from another better movie. And yeah. it was, it, was I thought, I thought it turned out really was a good gimmick, but the thing is nobody even watched this movie. The movie um, tanked. So. Um, I, I watched, I saw this movie. Yeah. At the time or <laughs> it's, it's sometime later on. Yeah. No, at the time when it came out, I remember. I think I may have seen it in the theater. I think Gene Simmons actually approached Mad and gave, basically. I know I had the copy of the script and a copy, a video of the movie before it came out. And I think he was like pitching Mad, you know, please, would you do a parody of the movie? And so we yeah. did. But the, he wanted a cover. He wanted a Kiss Mad cover. He didn't get that. <laughs> oh yeah, I, he's ever the uh, the promoter. Know, what is it? Yeah. Promoter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, moving on to our next bit of chicken fat. Oh, this is Desmond. Can you name this? This is tight. This is not my parody of Kojak because I was a little kid. Um, <laughs> Mr. Clean Fish. No, I think you got me again. Um, okay. Is it here? Yeah. An ear should be my clue. I imagine it's not working. <laughs> All right, Tom. Do you recognize this? Yep, that's from the parody of X Men Two. Oh, <laughs> Professor X. Professor yes. X, okay. and this is from Cracked Magazine. Yeah. Oh, oh I mean, I've seen this. <laughs> so. So it's, it's actually the first. It's that's the first X Men movie. Then I thought oh, it would have yeah. been. Yeah, I thought because I did X Two for Mad, I did X One for Crack. <laughs> yeah, sorry, we 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 retracted the chicken, and we gave you. I, no, no, okay. I, it's fair game. That doesn't that doesn't count because these are supposed to be mad images, not crap. At no point did I say that they would all be mad there's, images. There's a mad I artist think. in here anyway. So, yeah. um, if you'd done the Tom, Tom and I did next time parody. If you'd done the one um, where Professor X and Magneto in the movie they were sitting in a room playing chess together. We had them playing Hungry Hungry Hippos. I would have gotten that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is, I think, our next one is a very important question, um, which is, all right, I'll, I'll admit it. So, um, Tom, did you ever have the opportunity to draw Simpy Dumpkins? And if not, tell us how this has negatively impacted your career. This question comes from D. Culpa. <laughs> D. Culpa from beyond, the, from the great beyond. <laughs> um, I refuse to draw Simpy Dumpkins, and I've uh, never regretted that <laughs> my whole life. Maybe responsible so. for his wide career. <laughs> <laughs> if if somebody came up to you at a con, I know you you do cons all the time, and you you get requests for all sorts of illustrations. If somebody requested a Simpy Dumpkins. <laughs> would, would you oblige them? If you went to a hundred thousand conventions at once, somebody came up. <laughs> you know, I guess I guess I probably would oblige, especially if they were, you know, like uh uh not, uh, nice about it. All right. <laughs> yeah. We I, I would charge I have, extra uh, though. All right. <laughs> all right. We have uh well we did a, a little bit of a, a cracked um, uh, cracked conversation with well, Dick Culpa episode of the Potter CB podcast. Um, and did you, did you have any interactions with Mr. Culpa? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can you elaborate? Yeah. 
Um, you know, I'm not going to sit here and talk smack about the guy, but uh, he was in way over his head. He had a he had a good heart. He really wanted to make it work, but he, you know, he just he he had fundamental problems with understanding how humor magazines worked. I mean, you're talking about a guy who insisted on adding word balloons to a pantomime cartoon because he thought it would appeal to more people if there were words. And yeah. you're trying to explain to him that a pantomime cartoon appeals to everybody because there are no words. But well, I I was I wrote into Mad for years trying to get Sergio to put word balloons in a Mad <laughs> like that. I I mean, so I, it sounds like a good idea to me. <laughs> but no, I mean, like by all by all accounts, he does. He seemed like a great guy, um, and he did. He had a, a big hand in. Oh, hold on. One of my favorite things, which was uh, the Weekly World News. So I'm a I'm a Culpa fan. I I must say. Um, well, Cul Culpa claims to have invented Bat Boy. Oh. Oh yeah. Or claimed now, claimed that that was his invention. Bat Boy was his. He came up with it. Uh, you know. Do you, okay. <laughs> I've got I've got nothing to corroborate that with. All I'm saying is that Dick told me I invented Bat Boy. Yeah. Uh, at the Weekly World credited. News. He's credited. I've always heard him credited as being the inventor. Is well, there? I'm sure he is. I, you know, I, I know. <laughs> is, there, is there a controversy about this? Are people fighting? I don't, I don't think so. But, oh, I thought, <laughs> Tom, but, the way you said it, I thought like uh, something was going to follow. Well, I was going to say. I no. think Bill Finger invented back away. <laughs> yeah, it could be. And Dick was just taking uh, taking credit for it, but it was all Bill Finger's idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, moving on. So uh, Desmond, or uh, Tom, this one's for you. Rippling abs, no underpants, a breezy kilt, dressed like that, Willie could be Grant Marshall of the next gay oh, pride okay. parade. Oh, my God. <laughs> this was drawn by, I think, Peter Bag. Uh, yeah, I guess when you turn the yeah when you show it, I think so. That one's got me stumped. I've got no idea where that's from. This is from. Yeah. So like, we have to get the goose. We have to get the goose before. Yeah. Like, there we go. Character is gay. Yeah. That, uh, yep. Which Simpsons character is gay? Yeah. yeah they, they um, like, before one season, they said they're going to out one of the characters in the Simpsons. So we, we I came with this idea and. Oh, drawn by Gary uh, Halleck. Hall oh, Hall not Peter Bragg. Okay, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. Our next. Our uh, next uh, actually, if I can interject, this is one of the – whenever I thought of it, I, I didn't do this often enough for my career for the magazine, but sometimes I would think of a joke that was funny. And then I said, if I can sort of like take apart this – dismantle this joke and figure out what makes it work, I could turn that into a premise for an entire article. Like basically the structure of that joke might work you know, 12 more times and you get an article out of it. And so this yeah. is one of those, when I heard about the Simpsons thing, the first thing I, I thought of a joke immediately, I said, maybe I should like do all the characters that are gay and like the you know, ostensible reasons why. And or, always, always when that happens, I, I saw an article to Mad, the joke I thought of, the original joke always made the article. This is the one exception <laughs> where like the, yeah. literally the joke that inspired the article itself was not used. And basically, yeah. um, it was partly because it was a very um, obscure character. I Probably because the joke was too dirty, probably. But basically, there's a character called Cletus the Slack-Jawed Yokel. You know, like that's the Yokel like, character? Yeah. I He had a song. Some right. vocal. Never yeah, listen that's to right. Right. And again, some vocal. So this article was like, you know, um, you know, Mr. Burns is gay because this. And this is, you know, and B-Man is gay because of that. And so it was Sleek, Cletus the Slack-Jawed Yokel. And my joke was, how do you think he got so slack-jawed? <laughs> and they just did not go for that because like, it was too suggestive. So. But they took the article anyway. Yeah. I like how I, I'm going to have to call Gary and tell him I like the uh, cameo he did of Dick Culpa in this piece because mm -hmm. he's he's right between right underneath Sideshow Bob there in the uh, on the right hand side. So. <laughs> uh, the sea captain, yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Dick Culpa 
often wearing is uh, his captain's hat. Mm -hmm. Listen, once I go gray hair, I'm I'm putting on a captain's hat, <laughs> like one hundred percent. Our next Patreon question is from David Strickler. Mad has a long-standing habit of having presidents on its covers. Is there any way we can get President Biden on a future reprint for the sake of tradition and before it's too late? Perhaps you can contact Susie and see if she's up for one before the year is out. Old Suze. Well, Susie's doing a great job with like very little support. So um, maybe they'll do like, you know, they, the man is now all theme issues. It's all reprints and they'll do like, you know, pets or they'll do, you know, sports or something. So maybe they have a political one lined up for the end of the year because they know the election's coming. And maybe they'll come up with a Biden joke for that. Yeah. But, there's, yeah, I mean, whatever. There's just not a lot of new material being put into bad these days. So whether, you know, Joe Biden makes the cut of a cover. I can't, her. I can't pitch it because I've already done my yearly cover for Mad. <laughs> ah. yeah. Are they doing like a rotation or something or? No, but it just seems like I get one a year. They, yeah. You know, I just, I get a call and say, hey, we've got a cover for you. And the next one that comes out is got, is my cover. Oh, okay. Right. So um, and it's coming out in a couple of days. I mean, you probably know this yourself. Basically, there's new covers and there's new fold-ins. That's, yeah. that's the issues that come out. And obviously, if, if people haven't seen the material that's being reprinted, then it's new to them. So that's good. And it keeps the brand alive. But it's, yeah, it's, a, little, it's a little more abundant, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, do you guys, I mean, do you have Sue's on speed dial? Can you, you think you could pitch one? <laughs> we can contact Sue's. I've, I've sent her emails about other stuff, like completely unrelated to like, you know, please buy this or something. You know, so um, just you know, I say that somebody's birthday is coming up. I said they might want to do a shout out in the mad, you know, um, you know, X, you know, Twitter connection. So. Yeah. And then here's um, a follow-up question. Since you guys are in contact right. with Suze, since you're in contact with Suze, does Suze ever ask about me? <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if she asked about me. <laughs> well, I, could tell. I can't think so. All right. Well, uh, this is from Ed Meisinger. A Claptrap was about the best book I've ever read. Can you tell me when Claptrap 2 is coming out? <coughs> We've been sort of batting that around for years now. So I don't, I, it's, it really sort of depends on how well the first one ends up doing. And it's not there, it's not there yet because basically you've got other books to sell, like, uh, copies of the first Claptrap. So we don't really know the numbers or the results of it, you know, in a full sense yet. It took so long to do the first one and we can't like launch into the second one, which, you know, for all we know, may not be as popular as the first one. It, you know, we, we have to get the numbers. Yeah. Yeah. We'd, we'd have to start, we'd have to come close to selling out our print run before we even start thinking about it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as much as people love this and I've heard only positive things about it, um, you know, uh, you you guys are in business, like, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it has to like that's part of the decision process. Is like, can we make money on it? Um, and that is like, yeah. So if you guys like <laughs> this, want to see more of it, you know, go to claptrapbook.com. <laughs> tell your friends if you think your friends would like something like this. Mm -hmm. If they missed Mad Magazine, tell them to go to claptrapbook. I just I just heard from somebody who bought a book and they and they contacted me said so they had bought a second book for like their husband's cousin or something who like, would like this. I mean, so that, you know, but it's, it's a bit by bit, it sort of spreads, but it's, you know, it's, it's more a matter of like, you know, the, the book was a success and made money, but did it make enough money to carry Tom and I for a number of years of, you know, doing this and, and to the exclusion of other things. We just, we, we'll, we'll know when, you know, the print run is, you know, getting close to the end and how long yeah. it takes and, you know, what we, what we could theoretically expect from a second project. I mean, you know, Tom and I, had a great time doing this. I mean, and I, you know, I have more admiration for his art and the art, all the art, the mad guys in general, just by seeing the process up more up close than I ever had before all the years I spent at mad. So, you know, there's nothing, there's, no, there's nothing between the two of us stopping in the book, but we just got to see how the book itself does as a product in the marketplace. Yeah. And, you know, also, it's important to remember for people who are watching and people who want a claptrap too is not everybody is terminally online like I am and will hear about it. So it's like if you, you know, mm -hmm. there's people who would love this who don't know about this. 
um, because mm-hmm. they they don't live on on the internet. Um, I'm kind of scrolling through, and Kyle, maybe you could find it. Uh, Doug Guilford asked a, asked a question earlier on. Who's um, that? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great question. Doug Guilford, he's the <laughs> owner of CrackedCoverSite.com. <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, if you go to crackedcoversite.com, it will be uh, it will bring you to his website. What reactions have you received from the various mad editors? Um, oh, um, reactions to, uh, claptrap. Well, a, a, bu- a bunch of the editors back the book themselves personally. So I mean, the, um, let's see. Um, J- uh, Dave Croato contacted me and said, "Would you like me to look at some of these scripts so I could, like, you know, go over them and you know, give any, you know." input I could and I said hell yes you could you know, and, he, and he did and um, you know he made some very good points I, I took most of them he, he suggested a couple of jokes and I used a co- some of those during the book so Dave is a you know, you know invisible co-writer of the book in that sense um, yeah. Yeah, um, Sam Viviano was you know was very he was eager to get the book and he's he's, he's wondering if we're going to do a second one and if it's just going to be the two of us you know <laughs> is it possible to you know open it up so yeah, we know we've got nothing but support. I mean, Susie got a book. I mean, there's a lot. There's you know, we've had no problems like you know, as far as like people saying, "What do you, what the hell do you think you're doing?" Uh, people yeah. were really sort of pleased that we were doing it at all, and I think they were happy with the outcome. Yeah, yeah. I got a nice. Uh, I got a nice note from John Fakara, who just said, uh, "You know, you should be proud of this. It really turned out great." You know, basically <clears throat> paraphrasing, but high praise from. A guy who basically, you know, put Matt out for 40 years or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, we've we've gotten some great feedback from from Mad people. I think some of them were were uh, jealous to see us do something that we didn't get rushed on or <laughs> had uh, you know <laughs> had to hit under deadlines. Boy, that sounds pretty good. But <clears throat> but of course, they all understand how much work it was too. So you know, because they all did it. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, you can see uh, by looking at the book itself. But you know, there's a lot of you know time and a lot of you know energy put into it. So, yeah, we don't, we don't uh, want to rush it just because people were anxious to get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and that's like you know I said often on the stream because it would come up from time to time, and you guys were like you're very good at sending out updates to the mm-hmm. to the backers. Um, well, Tom insisted I, on that. That's I'll give Tom the credit for like do, setting that up. <laughs> Like yeah. every week, no matter what. I mean, that goes a long way. I back a lot of things on um, like Indiegogo, like a lot mm-hmm. of comic book projects. And um, I don't I don't pay attention after I donate, but it'll be like several years. It, it's not uncommon for me to receive a package in the mail. Be <laughs> like, oh, wait, this was from two years ago. Uh, mm-hmm. How wonderful. Um, so yeah, like for me, it was just like, you know, no problem. Like I didn't, I mean, well, also transparency here. I I actually put my order in, in the month before it came out. So (laughs) (laughs) order's an order. (laughs) We had, Um, we had had more than one person say we should print the um, updates as a separate book. I said, we're not, we haven't gotten this claptrap two yet. Whether we can do that. (laughs) The the market for our updates must be vast. (laughs) Uh, I don't know that that would sell as well. Yeah, um, I don't, I'm not sure myself. <laughs> so if you guys, uh, if you would like, we have one more game for you to play. Now, um, Kyle, could we go back to the the three of us? Get the, the what is this called? There we go. Um, now, for, I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, long time mad writer, Dickie D, that's what we call him here. His name's Dick D. Bartolo. <laughs> He was a, a game show host, or not host, a writer on a game show called Match Game. Mm-hmm. And because of this, I thought it would be fun to do a little bit of a, a mad-themed match game with you guys. So uh, for those of you who have not seen the match game, Kyle seems to think, producer Kyle seems to think that nobody knows what the match game is. Um, <laughs> we had a we had an argument on Instagram about this. Uh, Here's you lost. <laughs> <laughs> we need a poll. Everybody, give a thumbs up in the chat if you know what uh, the match game is. So, in the match game, normally there's a panel of celebrities. There's six celebrities, and there's two contestants. And uh, you're given a prompt. 
uh, with like a kind of a fill in the blank type of thing. And you write in one word or short phrase. And if yours, if what you write matches any of the celebrity contestants, you get a point. Now we don't have, um, I mean, you guys are the celebrities in the scenario. Uh, <laughs> and so this is a, a heavily modified version of match game. You're going to be kind of playing. It's sort of, what's the one where it was like, it's sort of the match game and the newlyweds game combined. Uh, so you guys are going to be, I'll give you a prompt and you'll uh, write down on a, a piece of paper, your one word answer. And then when, uh, when I tell you, you can hold it up. Um, those of you who are watching live or in the live chat, we want you to play along too. And you can keep your own score. If you match either Desmond Devlin or Tom Richmond's answer, you get one point for for each uh, of these contestants. And you can that point. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, welcome to The Match Game with our contestants and celebrity uh, features, uh, Desmond Devlin and Tom Richmond. Audience, I hope that you have your whiteboards and markers ready. Our first prompt is this. We're still working out the bugs. I went on an extravagant vacation with William Gaines, but all he wanted to do was... We'll give you a few moments to down your answer. Oh my God, is this a joke? Is, is, is Dickie D in the audience right now? Oh, poor Jack. <laughs> I went on an extravagant vacation with William Gaines, but all he wanted to do was, uh, Desmond Devlin, please reveal okay. your answer. I'm going to say... Eat! Oh, Big <laughs> Bartolo gets a point. Tom Richmond, your answer? Sugar! <laughs> <laughs> oh, unfortunately, it doesn't look like any of the uh, our audience members matched with you um, you know Gigi right. Bartolo save single-handedly saved the match game and now it's being destroyed tonight so it's, it's really <laughs> terrible terrible experience I imagine everything everything comes full circle <laughs> well you know what Des I was gonna say the winner gets a kiss but okay. now <laughs> I'm rethinking that uh, all right our next prompt mm -hmm. Paul Coker was a guest lecturer at a local college. He tied one off last night and took a peek behind the scenes at... <laughs> Write your answers now. Ooh, Vanessa Maya got her answer in. All right. This time we'll start with Tom Richmond. Tom Richmond, what was your answer? The girls' locker room. Ooh. Rosemary well, would uh, be unhappy with me. <laughs> uh, Des, what was yours? Hallucinations. <laughs> he was going to draw hallucinations too. So, you know, <laughs> size in. Yeah. <laughs> I think I don't know. Maybe Sticks McFly might have the closest answer to uh, to getting a point, and he wrote a sorority. Um, uh, okay, our third prompt of this evening is Kaputnik says, "Doctor, it must be your first day. You're supposed to give me advice, not start and start writing." Remember, audience, even if you're not writing in the chat, you can still keep score. The winner gets a big old kiss. Mm -hmm. 
Ooh, Angel Acevedo. It writes in a headache. Shane's hobbies. Punishment. Ooh, Yankees Blues Preacher. A prostate exam. And uh, Dick D. Bartolo, a massage. All right, Desmond. <laughs> Who's supposed to give you a prostate exam besides a doctor? I wonder. Because that seems a little sketchy. But... Friends and family only. Uh, <laughs> 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 All right, that so no nobody put heroin down. A very close hernia check. Um, you start with the letter H. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna call that a match. All right, <laughs> yeah, Shane, you get a match point for that one. Tom, what was your answer? You're supposed to give me advice, not a bill. Oh. Oh, look at that. No, nobody got that one. No points except for Shane. Here we have the lighter side of heroin. <laughs> All right. Our next prompt. <clears throat> Frank Jacobs has fallen on hard times. He's given up poetry and now writes. This is the music I hear when I walk down the street. It's really good, yeah. Esmond Devlin has his answer locked in. Tom mm -hmm. Richmond, are you ready? I am. All right. Uh, who do we start with? We're starting with you, right, Tom? Uh, sure, yeah. yeah, sure. <laughs> All right. Frank Jacobs has given up poetry and now writes Dirty Limericks. That's a dirty once poetry. Yeah. GM Spe uh, Spectre got a point for that. He does? Yep. Dirty limericks on bathroom walls. <laughs> Ooh, what? Holy smokes. That's there a real match. You know. <laughs> Harvey Esquire, game show bits. Dick DiBartolo, a love column. Oh, Desmond, graffiti. <laughs> I bet he would be. He He's... Frank Jacobs is the kind of guy that writes really thoughtful gra graffiti on, like, a bathroom stall. You know, the types that really make you think. I'll tell you one of the things we one of the things we did in Claptrap when we did a parody of the Princess Bride. Actually, our backers told us we had to do a parody of the Princess Bride, and yeah. the immediate impediment was that basically the movie is sort of a parody of itself in some ways, and it's very self-aware. And what they're talking about, like tropes <laughs> and things. And so, so that's usually our job <laughs> to sort of bring those things out and you know take them apart. But they'd already done it in the movie, so I had the idea of doing it as a musical which uh, yeah. if anybody's seen the book would you know, see how it turned out. But in, in the back of my mind, I always had, I had Nick Meglin on this shoulder and Frank Jenkins on this shoulder to make sure I didn't like cheat and use like half rhymes. You know, make sure the <laughs> syllable, if there's internal rhymes, you got to keep the meter, not just the number of syllables. And so I, I, I you know, it was a, a lot, a lot, it's a lot more research and a lot more diligence to make sure that, you know, their ghosts wouldn't haunt me <laughs> for yeah. you know, a half ass job on a single line. Cause you know, if, if Nick was alive and he saw that, as soon as I walked in the office, he'd be on me. So I, I said, I can't let that happen, even though he's not in the office anymore. <laughs> yeah, I imagine it has to be a lot of internal pressure, almost because you know everybody, everybody loves Frank Jacobs. Mm -hmm. And so everybody will be like, well, how does Desmond do? Oh, if you want to say I'm no Frank Jacobs, they're correct. <laughs> but yeah. hopefully that's something, you know, that Frank Jacobs is like, oh, all right, that's all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, Producer Kyle, do we have any more? Um, I think we only have one or two. All right, here we go. Monroe says, Mom, the new Mad is okay, but I'd rather be reading. Longtime readers of the show, they know what answer I'm expecting. <laughs> Oh, guys, this is a family show. Come on, Harvey Esquire. There's some perverted families out there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Des, mm -hmm. Monroe right. says, Mom, it's okay, but I'd rather be reading Cat Fancy. Sure. <laughs> oh, no points given for that. That's shocking. 
Tom Richmond, what would Monroe rather be reading? A menu. <laughs> no points given. No points given. But thank you, guys. Uh, the the correct answer was uh, was cracked. Oh. <laughs> uh, all right. What is? I think. <laughs> Oh, geez, Louise. Kraft gets no respect. And uh, you know what? I'm I'm pretty disrespectful of it. Um, I think we have just one more. Um, Al Jaffe's wife is going mad. Yesterday, Al tried to fold the... Our final match game answer to put out. Will you get a point on the board? What are the scores right now? Here we go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, I think you have seven. <laughs> uh, all right. Al Jaffe's wife is going mad. Yesterday, Al tried to fold the what, Tom? <laughs> oh, what did say? The dog. Oh, and Shane's <laughs> Hobbies gets another point. He had the cat. Crash <laughs> BBZ gets the point. Dick D. Bartola says, hold the easy chair. Hold the toilet seat. And, ah, oh, stick. <laughs> what did I say, man? This is a family show. Get out of here with that. <laughs> our answers. Our answers. <laughs> Golly. All right. Gentlemen, we are coming up on our final time. Producer Kyle, if we can get back to the, the three thing. Um, let us please remind the viewers uh, live and watching later the whole reason why you are here. You're here. Um, what are you doing? Uh, what's the phrase? You're selling a book. Great book. Oh, could you put the the big thing on? Claptrap. Claptrap book. Claptrapbook.com by Desmond Devlin and Tom Richmond. A hardcover collection of movie parodies in the classic humorous vein. As see, you can use that bottom part that says as seen on flipping through. I'll, <laughs> um, I, I can get you guys <coughs> to put on it. All right, let's get this down. But uh, yeah, you guys, uh, do you have any parting words for our guests? Well, it's nice to you know, want to listen in on our book. It took so long to do. Um, What's what's the next holiday? It makes a great you know May Day gift. <laughs> yeah, I'll be at uh, I'll be at Chicago Comic Con um, uh, later this month at C two E two with copies of the book. So if anybody's there, come on up. And uh, uh, if you bring your copy, I'll sign it. You know, mm -hmm. um, nice. but uh, yeah, so. We're going to start taking them to Comic Con. They get in the yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. But and, um, at, as you said earlier, if somebody asks nicely, you will draw a picture of Simpy Dumpkins. Yeah. So, yeah. Like I said, I'll charge extra. <laughs> yeah. I'll charge extra for the wounding of my pride. But, um, <laughs> but my pride's for sale. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I want to say, like, thank you sincerely for coming on the show, guys. I really had a wonderful time. And uh, thank you for playing my silly games <laughs> and uh, answering all these questions. Um, I really I had a wonderful, wonderful time. So um, if you guys are watching, also remember, hit like, hit subscribe, leave comments. That's the number one way that you can support this channel and help this channel grow. Um, and with that, thank you so much for watching. Toodaloo.